We'll start in Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles seven. I'm going to share a couple of things with you this morning, and then um, dive into something that I believe is really a lost tool in the Christian's tool belt in 21st century Christianity. And I think it is so important if we're going to see God move. Um, finish this phrase. Drastic times call for drastic measures. And I think it's time for God's people to get serious. Um, I'm so thankful for what God has already done as I've been uh, really seeking Him. I've been, I've been astonished. I've been really blown away to see what the Lord is doing. And if we're not careful, one of my, one of my fears is that some would experience revival while others miss it. Um, Fanny Crosby wrote the hymn, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. And it says, While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. And when God begins to stir, what a, what a tragedy, what a shame it would be to be sitting there while there's the moving hand of God and miss it, and miss it. One of the things is I've studied and I've looked at uh, revivals in years gone by. One of the key characteristics that would take place was, uh, is real repentance would take place. And people would truly turn from lifestyle sins. Um, and that's one of the things I might look for. I, I'm not necessarily <laughs> preaching specifically on certain sins or anything like that, but I'm watching, Lord, are you going to start stirring some folks? And I was so encouraged this week, as a couple of different instances, as people came up to me and said, Pastor, I have a problem with this, and I have a problem with this. Would you help me with this? And I need, I need, I need a little more accountability, and I need a prayer partner, and I need, and I'm thinking, the Lord's stirring. The Lord's stirring. I hope that's your prayer this morning. Lord, while and others thou art calling, please, don't pass me by. Don't pass me by. Look at Second Chronicles 7. This is probably one of the uh, oft misapplied verses of the scriptures, but I want to show you a principle that we do find from here. Oftentimes, in fact, on maybe 4th of July, I would say uh, a, probably a good number of churches across America might use this text as though the text is about America. It's not. It's about Israel, and it's about Solomon and his temple that he dedicated to the Lord. But there's a principle in here I want you to see that I believe God has proven time and time again over the years that if people will follow this principle, he does something. So what happened was, uh, just to get the context, Solomon had finally completed the building of the temple, um, and, uh, and they had all the, the, the priests and the ministers of the temple, and they were there ready to serve, and they began to sacrifice, and the Shekinah glory of God descended on that place, and the, the presence of God and the smoke filled the place. It was so thick and so strong and so palatable that, uh, that, 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 that they couldn't even minister to God. They just sat there. Now think about that, you're ready to sacrifice, you're ready to worship, but you can't do a thing because of God's presence is so strong in that place. And this went on for seven days, and they began to sacrifice, and Solomon brought a huge uh, uh, sacrifice, many, many sheep and oxen and different things, and, and so God begins to commune with, with Solomon after this seven-day period. By the way, I will say this, upon the dedication of the temple, this place, this Israel, experienced revival. Sometimes when we look at this verse we're about to read and say, here's the formula for revival. No, no, they were coming out of revival. This is the formula for God to turn His judgment. Look at verse number 12, 2 Chronicles 7 and verse number 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. That would be the temple. God accepted the temple. Verse 13, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. A few years ago, we experienced some worldwide pestilence. Some of it was greatly exaggerated, but our world experienced some things. He says some of these things may happen. We may get some famine. We may get some drought. We may get some pestilence. 
And he says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now, is God talking? My eyes shall be open and my ears attend to the prayer that is made in this place. For I have chosen and sanctified the house that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Now, of course, we know he's talking about the, the temple there. And I think about today that uh, in, um, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy and he talked about how the church of the living God should be called the house of the Lord. That thou oughtest know how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And uh, so there's definitely a lot of parallels as, as, uh, as God is no longer working through a nation, but is working through a people that he has given his name to. We call ourselves Christians. And there's a lot of parallels here, and I just want to say this. How many of you would have a similar assessment that I have that, uh, that our world is sick? In an earlier part of Isaiah, he uh, makes the assessment of the nation of Israel, and he, said, he basically says of them, you guys are sick in the head. You're a stiff-necked people. In fact, he even goes so far as to say even a donkey knows how to go, get back home where he's fed. And he tells Israel, you are dumber than a donkey. That's what he's telling them. Because you don't even know how, where to go and to come to this hand of blessing that I have for you. I've given you the formula for blessing, for God to move and God to work. And what do we do? We do exactly what Israel did. We chase after pleasures. We chase after the gods round about us. And we begin to miss the hand of God. And we commit idolatry over and over again in our hearts. That's what these lifestyle sins turn into. It's idolatry. And he says, guys, I want to hear from heaven and forgive you, and heal you. I want to talk this morning about humility and fasting for revival. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us this morning. I pray that every one of us would truly, humbly seek your face. I pray that every one of us would turn from our wicked ways, Lord, I pray that we'd be a people and there would be a place that you could pour out your blessing. Lord, I'm so stirred for this thing of revival. Would you revive us again that your people may rejoice? And we ask all these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look at it real quick, Psalm 35. Psalm 35. We see there that uh, God gives the formula and he says, look, if these things are overtaking your land, Turn back to me. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked way. See, it's so often we are, we're pointing out, look at how wicked our society has gotten. Look at this, this movement and this crowd, and look at how they're corrupting our culture, and look at what they're doing in the government level, and look at, we're pointing to all these things, but, but God always brings it back, if my people, if my people. In fact, if I were to read my Bible correctly, the heathen are doing exactly what the heathen do. It's God's people who are not doing what God says they ought to do. It's on us. I like to do sometimes with the, the prophets of old, and even David did this. And What they would do is they would confess the sins of their fathers. Wait a minute, that was my father's sin. No, no, no. It's us taking ownership so we can stop this cycle, visiting the iniquities of the, of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. Uh, confessing the, the national sins. Folks, every baby that is slaughtered in this country, is on, that's on our watch. You say, well, I didn't vote for abortion. Folks, the only reason it's legal in America is because God's people aren't doing anything. Look at uh, Psalm 35 and verse number uh, 13. I'm sorry, verse, yeah, yeah, verse 13. The psalmist said, uh, uh, this is David, and he said, But as for me, when they were sick, those that were attacking him, he says, My, clothes were, uh, was, my clothing was sackcloth, and I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. Here's David. He said he humbled his soul with fasting. Can I say humility is always attractive to God? 
God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Let me just say, we are in a day where we are in desperate need of God's grace. And, and, he, and, and so here's David. He said, I humbled my soul before God through what? Fasting. In uh, Matthew 17, you don't have to turn there, but here's the story. A man comes to Jesus, and, well, he comes to his disciples, and, uh, and uh, it's actually one of my, dad, my dad's life verses in that passage where, where it says, oh, Lord, have mercy on me, for my son is a lunatic. <laughs> but he comes to the disciples, and he says, uh, he says, here's what he does. He throws himself in the fire, and he throws himself in the water. Here's this dad. He's at his wit's end. He doesn't know what to do with his son. Every time he's around a danger, his son throws himself at the danger. And he says this statement, he says to Jesus, I brought him to your disciples and they could not help him. Folks, these were the disciples that were given authority over unclean spirits. He says they could not help him. So Jesus said, how long will I be with you and how long shall I suffer you? Bring the lad unto me. And he, he casts out the devil and, and the man goes on his way. The disciples meet with Jesus a little bit later and uh, they said, why couldn't we cast him out? He said, guys, if you just believe, you know, you have all this authority, you have all this power. But then he says, how be it this kind? This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. There are certain spiritual battles in this world, let me just say, we will never win unless we take it to the next level and humble our souls with fasting. Another phrase that's used in scriptures is afflicting your soul with fasting. Saying, God, I'm serious. Now listen, this is not a topic that's, I mean, this is rarely preached in churches. This is rarely dealt with, fasting. And can I say it this way? I was, uh, I was visiting with a pastor friend of mine. He's one of the first ones to introduce me to fasting and uh, been somewhat of, of a mentor in my life. But I remember uh, probably 2006, yeah, all the way back in 2006, um, I was with a couple other pastors, and I was a young preacher just getting into the ministry. And we had a fast prayer and fasting conference. There was probably 10 of us, 8 of us. And we just came apart. We spent the first part of the week, we started fasting, but then we met up on Thursday. And it was a Thursday through Saturday sort of a conference. And we had a, a little retreat center, and we just gave ourselves to prayer and fasting. And we'd wake ourselves up at midnight, and we'd pray. And then we woke ourselves up at 3 a.m., and we'd pray. And then during the day, we would take turns preaching and praying and, and praying and praying. And, and on the last day there, this pastor friend of mine, who had done a 40-day fast, came and met with us and talked to us about fasting. In fact, many, many churches that he went to, he taught about fasting. The churches are losing this tool in the Christian school belt. It's a spiritual tool. It's a weapon that is directly connected to the deeper and the stronger uh, spiritual warfare aspect of things. That this kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting. He said, we're losing it. When I caught a hold of something, and he said, I'm going to make fasting part of my ministry. We need the power of God. So I was talking with him the other day. He's suffered a series of strokes and things, and he's not pastoring anymore, but he's still preaching and encouraging churches and things. But he's still so burdened about this. He said, Christians aren't getting it. They're not getting this. Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted of the devil after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And the devil comes to him and he says, I know you're hungry. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? Jesus says to the devil, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. See, there are some nutrients and there are some, there are some things that are, that are much uh, more needful than food. Job said, I, I have esteemed thy word more, uh, greater than my necessary food. The Word of God, and, and it's, it's, it's sacrificing the physical for the spiritual. It's telling God, Lord, I'm serious, and I'm, I'm putting aside some of these fleshly appetites, and I'm putting aside some of these things. So that, that uh, pastor friend of mine, he said this. He said, you know, a lot of people, they may start talking about fasting, but they're, they're not talking from an experiential level. They don't know what in the world they're talking about. Uh, a friend of mine actually wrote a book on fasting, and all that he had done at the time of writing that book was he had done a three-day fast. 
And I, I'm thinking, you, you don't even know about fasting. And I'm not saying this from a, from a pride position. What I'm saying is this is one of the disciplines in the Christian life. Now, what's interesting about fasting is not one place in Scripture are we commanded to fast. Did you know that? Not one place. Old Testament, New Testament, there's nowhere in the Bible we're commanded to fast. But it is assumed. They came to Jesus and they said, you know, John, his disciples, they're fasting and, uh, and you know, your, your disciples are, are eating away. And he says, well, you know, is the, is the bride going to fast while the bridegroom is with him? He said, oh, but the time will come when they will fast. They will fast. See, fasting is completely optional and it's a sacrifice to the Lord. Let me share a couple things real quick. Uh, so first thing um, is this idea that, uh, that fasting... Is, uh, is something that is necessary for some of these deeper spiritual battles that we may get into. And we'll look at that. Uh, in fact, while, while I'm talking about this, why don't you turn to Isaiah 58. We'll spend some time there. Isaiah 58. I appreciate that song, uh, Sweet Hour of Prayer. We're going to talk about prayer in one of these Sundays on Revival. For there's no revival that will take place without prayer. How many of you are familiar with the name Charles Finney? Great revivalist of yesteryear. He was asked about his revivals, and there's a lesser known person that was involved with his ministry who had an intercessory prayer ministry by the name of Daniel Nash. And what Nash would do is whenever Finney would go into a town, prior to him going to the town, Nash would go to the town. They'd pray and decide where does God want him to go next. And this man would go to the town while while Finney's still in another town hosting a meeting. He would check into some cheap hotel room. He would lock himself in. And he would give himself to prayer and fasting. There were times where, uh, where the innkeeper would kind of knock on his door. He saw a light there, and, and he would contact, you know, he had a contact number. He'd contact Finney or somebody else, and he'd say, is this person okay? They, they have not left their room. And I come by at night, and I, I see a little flicker of a candle light, and I'll hear groaning going on in there. And I'll say, leave him be. He's doing his ministry. And that place would be so saturated in prayer that by the time Finney got there, this place had already, the soil had already been turned. The place had already, the, had already been primed. And they were ready for revival. Charles Spurgeon was, uh, would have visitors and they'd go see the great Metropolitan Tabernacle there in London. And, uh, and they'd, say, they'd say, what is the secret of your power when you preach? He pastored the largest church in his day. Uh, they would have five services every Sunday, and then one Sunday a month he would ask his, his, uh, his, his members to just stay home so there was room for visitors to come. Can you imagine having that problem? Guys, I want you to stay home and pray this Sunday because we're, we're having too many visitors. They need a chance to come and hear the gospel. He said, where's the source of your power? He said, follow me. And he took him to a little room, boiler room, if you would, below the platform where there would be scores of people just praying while he preached. He'd preach above while they were down below praying. How serious are we about God? God working. God making a difference. God doing something. Sometimes we talk about so much about the yesteryear, it's like God can't do anything anymore. It's like, like that, was, that was a different dispensation, 1800s. <laughs> no. I think the devil has done such a great job in so distracting us with our comforts and with our ease. You know, uh, we, get this, we get this message this morning about, about uh, uh, some missionaries over there experiencing some persecution today. And we're thinking, oh, you know, we'll pray for them, bless their hearts, while we're comfortable here in America. You know, let me tell you about the persecution I experienced yesterday. We went out door knocking, trying to show the gospel to people, and my hands got numb because it was cold. And that was as far as the persecution went yesterday. Persecution of nature. We're so comfortable. Leonard Ravenhill said, the reason we do not experience revival is because we can live without it. Folks, when we humble our souls by fasting, we're saying, God, I can't live without it anymore. We need revival. We need revival. Let me share with you a couple of things. Uh, 
if we, uh, I'm not going to go deep into this, but uh, throughout Scripture, the Bible talks about different things of fasting. Jesus, of course, warned about hypocritical fasting. When he talked about the Pharisees, they would fast and they would kind of, you know, they'd be like, oh, you know, I'm fasting, you know. Uh, and uh, what they would do is, um, uh, if you remember the story of the, of the Pharisee that was comparing himself to the publican who was kneeling down before God, wouldn't even look up towards heaven, and he would beat his chest. He said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mercy on me, a sinner. Here's the Pharisee over here saying, saying uh, Lord, I thank God that I'm not like these other sinners. And he says, for I fast twice in a week, and I give tithes of all that I have. And folks, fasting twice in a week, he probably means that, like, you know, I skipped a meal on Thursday and Tuesday. And he's bragging about it. And Jesus said, one walk away justified. See, Jesus, when he said, when you fast, go into your closet and, you know, fast in secret. And my father receiveth in secret, shall reward thee openly. You know, he talks about prayer, not, not praying in the public square, vain repetition, but, but to, 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 to pray in your closet and to give, secret, to give alms, uh, to give to the poor uh, in a secret way, not blowing a trumpet and saying, hey, everyone, look at what I'm giving. And so let me just say this. Because of that, we're kind of afraid to talk about fasting. But God was condemned, Jesus was condemning hypocritical fasting, where I'm making a big to-do about it. Look how spiritual I am, everybody, I fasted. Folks, I struggle with this because I want to teach you how to fast, but I also don't want attention drawn to me. So last Sunday, I came off my 10-day fast, and I only went 10 days. And I felt led of the Lord, and it's time to come off of it. I wanted to go further, but God said 10 days this time. But some of you knew I was fasting. My wife said, it looked like you were wearing your dad's suit. Don't worry, I got it back. It came back. You shall not surely die. I know it's hard for some people. You get through the day and your stomach's grumbling and everything. Well, the problem is we've trained ourselves, Americans especially. You know, did you, how many of you knew we eat more than we're supposed to? It's a discipline. I'll give you some practicalities. What I do is I will cut out caffeine a few days before, so I get the caffeine headache out of the way. And then, used to be then I would cut out sugar, but we've kind of cut out sugar from our diet anyway. I don't have to do that too much anymore. And then I go water only. There are two types of fasts. There's the water only, but then there's the absolute fast where you don't have any food or water, which is a very bad headache. But you can only do that up to like three days, and then you're going to start dying. You need water. But let me just tell you, you can go 40 days without food. No, no, you'll go. If you go two weeks, you'll die. I remember talking to a guy. He's like, you would die if you went that long. And I was like, I'm, you know, he's, he said, you'll die after like 12 days. And I was like, well, I've gone 15. I'm still here. I have several friends that have gone the whole 40. In fact, I have one friend that claimed to go 50. That, you get really dangerous when you get there. So what happens is, uh, just so you know, there's the practical side of it. When you begin fasting... Your body starts eating up all the fats. Amen. When it runs out of fats, it starts digesting muscle. When your muscle mass starts to run out of muscle mass to take, uh, then it starts going after organs. It's starting with the least needed, or the least vital, I should say, to, you know, and on. Now, don't worry. It doesn't start going after organs until you're well past, well past 40. Regardless of body type, if you go 40 days of fasting, you will lose 40 pounds, whether you're overweight or whether you're in shape. So think about Jesus, who is a healthy young man. He went 40 days fasting. He lost 40 pounds. He was probably weighing 115, 120 by the time he was done, maybe less, as a grown man. Very weak, very fragile at that point. Of course, your energy goes. You don't need sleep that much anymore because you're not digesting anything, so you're good with like four hours of sleep a night. And your mind initially goes through a fog, but then it gets clear. Your prayer life. You start praying and you feel you've stepped into the throne of God like instantly. Because you've said no to the flesh. See, so what happens is you begin, you begin starving the flesh, but you're feasting the spirit. And you're giving it all this stuff. Now, let me just say this. Men shall not by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you are fasting physically, it's not just starving yourself. You must be feasting on the spirit. You must be in the Bible. And so what I do is I call it this. I megadose the scriptures. 
You say, what's megadose? I go on a course for about getting through the Bible in 30 days. For my reading speed, that's about two hours of Bible a day. And I can get through my Bible in 30 days. I love it. God shows me things that, I mean, you know, and by the way, there's nothing more spiritual or less spiritual than reading your Bible faster or slower. Um, You need to find what God wants you to do, but I will say this, you better be spending some serious time in the Word. Okay, folks, this is not, I'm not sharing this to say, look how spiritual I am. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to coach and to train. When you have a new believer, they say, I've never prayed before. How do you teach them how to pray? Do you give them a checklist and say, all right, follow these things and you'll be a prayer warrior? No, you say, let's kneel down and let's pray together. I'm going to show you how to pray. I'm going to show you how I talk to God, and you should start learning how to talk to God. This is a hard one because, wait a minute, I thought fasting is private. I thought fasting is secret. I loved how we kicked off this year with a fasting chain. You know what that did? That got the whole church family together, and we're all figuring this fasting thing out together. And my son, with a super high metabolism, says, I'm going to go three days, Dad. I'm like, you sure? Yeah, I'm going three days. I wish I went three days when I was 14. I did my first fast when I was 25, probably. And it's a discipline. My wife will tell you, uh, when I first started, I would get very hangry and irritable. She'll, oh, great, he's fasting. Everyone watch out. But now do I do that? I'm patient. Here's what I do. She was afraid to, to, to eat in front of me, but I like to sit with the family. And so here's my little pleasure, my, my little cheat. I'll go over the food and go. And for me, that was it. Okay, I got, I got a smell. I'm good. Some of you might think, oh, isn't that torture? No, it's a little bit of pleasure, but then I, I get back into it. I didn't eat anything. Several reasons for fasting in Scripture. I'm just go through these real quick. Uh, in Judges 20, Israel fasted for a victory in war. 1 Samuel uh, 1, Hannah fasted for a son. 1 Samuel 7, Israel fasted in repentance. You'll see that a lot. Sackcloth and fasting. The idea of the sackcloth is I'm making myself physically uncomfortable. Um, 1 Samuel 31, the men of uh, 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 Jebusheglid fasted in mourning for Saul. In 2 Samuel 1, David and his men fasted in mourning uh, for Saul as well and for Jonathan and the fallen in Israel. In 2 Samuel 12, David fasted for mercy upon his child. By the way, did God grant mercy to his child? Fasting is not a guarantee. What's interesting about fasting, though, is many times you may go into fasting for a specific reason, and partway through, God changes your reason. And all of a sudden, I'm fasting for something completely different. And God, because here's what's happening. God's saying, all right, now you're getting in tune with me. Here's where I'm going with this. Um, 1 Kings 21, Ahab fasted for mercy. 2 Chronicles 20, uh, Jehoshaphat and Israel fasted for help and protection. Ezra 8, Ezra and the Jews fasted for help and protection. Nehemiah 1, Nehemiah fasted in mourning and for help. In Nehemiah 9, Israel fasted in mourning and repentance. Esther 4, Esther and her friends fasted for victory. Esther 9, fasting is mentioned as having had a role in the victory. Psalm 35, fasting and prayer and mourning. Psalm 69, fasting and prayer and mourning. Isaiah 58, which we'll look at in just a second, the fast which pleases God. Jeremiah 36, Israel fasted for mercy. In Joel 1, God commanded uh, fasting and repentance. God told them, here's what you do. Here's the formula, fast for um, uh, repentance. And um, Jonah 3, 5, the Ninevites fasted in repentance, uh, for repentance and mercy. And, um, and by the way, I love, I love Jonah because when Jonah, in Jonah's message, when he comes to Nineveh and he tells them, hey guys, uh, 40 days and God's going to wipe you out. He never said unless. He never said God's going to judge you unless you do such and such. No, no, the king, all the way down to the cattle, they said, no, no one, man or beast, is going to eat. We're going to put on uh, sackcloth. We're going to sit in ashes. And it just might be that God's going to turn from the wrath. And what happened? This pagan land, not God's people, God turned from the wrath. Daniel 9.3, Daniel fasted for wisdom. Matthew 4, Jesus fasted and then was tempted in the wilderness. Matthew 6, Jesus promised that the Father would bless fasting. Matthew 9, Jesus said his disciples would fast. 
Matthew 17, fasting is necessary to overcome some demonic strongholds. Mark 9, fasting is necessary to overcome demonic powers. Luke 2, fasting was part of Anna's service to God. Acts 13, fasting was a part of ministry for the workers in Antioch. It's when God told them to separate them, they were serving God and they were fasting. Acts 13, ordination was accompanied by fasting. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, fasting and prayer is the only proper reason for, uh, for abstinence from the physical relationship in marriage. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 5, fasting was one way that Paul approved himself as a minister of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, 27, Paul fasted often. And just a couple of reasons I wanted to share that, but, but I want to say this. There's something about humbling your soul before God to say, Lord, I'm serious about this thing. I need you to work, and I need you more than my necessary food, and, and I'm serious about this. Now, some people will say this, well, they'll, you know, they'll do different things. Uh, I, I personally think this is one way that the devil waters down this, this thing. And they'll say, well, I'm going to do, do electronics fast. And by the way, sometimes that's really healthy to do. Well, I'm going to do a fast from TV. I'm going to do a fast from social media. That's wonderful. Purge yourself, by the way, of these things. That's wonderful. But let's get back to what is a fast. What is the Bible talking about when it says fasting? It's, it's putting off something that I need for something that I need greater. So let's look at this. Look at Isaiah 58. Isaiah tells the prophet, or God tells the prophet Isaiah, he says, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression, transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Now, let me just say this. That does not sound like modern day preaching, does it? That's not very acceptable to show people their sins and to preach like a trumpet. It's interesting. It doesn't say the soothing sounds of a, of a stringed instrument or the mellow tone of a clarinet. Listen, a trumpet, you hear that thing. It is loud. How many of you had a, have ever played a trumpet or had a kid in the house that played a trumpet? It takes a little bit of endurance for a parent whose kid is learning the trumpet. Amen? I was at a men's meeting one time. There was a thousand men there, and the song leader played the trumpet. And he'd get, the, he'd get the guy singing, and then he'd start playing his trumpet over, and he didn't even need a microphone. I mean, he was filling that place with that trumpet. It's loud for a purpose. We have something to say. And God, and God says, I want you to lift up your voice like a trumpet, and here's the content of it. Tell my people their sins. Whoa. He says, you seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness. And forsook not the ordinance of their God. Ask of me the ordinance of justice and take delight in approaching God. He says, there was a time when you guys had it right. You had it down and you saw me and I, I gave it before you. Verse number three. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. Here's what the accusation is. God, we fasted and you paid no attention to us. That's their first accusation as it relates to fasting. And he said, uh, uh, he said Where, wherefore, we have afflicted our soul. That's the, the idea of fasting. And thou takest no knowledge. God didn't even notice. Behold, and, and so here's God's answer. Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. He said, you guys say you're fasting, but you're doing all the other stuff. You're still giving yourself pleasure. You're still laboring. Now, I will say this. You'd say, well, I can't do a 40-day fast and you know, take that many days off of my work. Um, I, I will say this. I do believe there is a difference of the intensity when you're talking about a day of fasting versus a season of fasting. I worked through my 10-day fast. In the past, I have did a 15-day fast, and I worked. In fact, one of my fasts was the hardest. I used to be a, uh, I used to be a trash man. No, excuse me. A solid waste collection specialist. <laughs> In the town that I was in, they didn't have the automated ones where it dumps itself. You had to actually pick it up. I'll tell you what, when you're fasting, by the way, when you're fasting, your other senses are heightened. That was a rough week. And I'm fasting. By the way, every time I did a serious fast, God, God gave me something. And that particular fast was right before God made me a pastor. Another fast, God led my wife and I to go start a church. I fasted for this church to start. It's amazing when I look back and I say, look, God did something here significant. God did something here significant. As God led in these things. But here's what he says to them. He says, you guys, yeah, you're fasting. You're starving yourself, but you're still taking pleasure. 
you're still doing your, all your labors. One of the reasons I had to come off of it, I said, there are too many chores I need to get done around the house before the super cold comes. <laughs> so I said, Lord, I, is it all right? I'm going to come off this. We'll pick it up again later. And God gave me permission. He says, Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure, you exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate. I'm fasting because I want to be right. To smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. In other words, God is saying, if you think this is going to make you more, uh, make me hear you better, you're missing something. Because, because you're still falling into all these traps. You're doing it in the flesh, and you're, you're hitting your chest with the fist of wickedness. Uh, you're not afflicting your soul in a way of humility and repentance. That's what God's looking for. And so, so when you humble yourself, he says you're missing something. There's no humility there whatsoever. So he says, uh, he says this, verse number 5. Is it such a fast as I have chosen? This is God speaking. Is this what I chose when it comes to fasting? Is this the prescription that I have laid out? Is this the fast that I've chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I've chosen? Now he's going to start laying it out. Here's what the fast he, he has chosen is going to accomplish. To loose the bands of wickedness. There are some spiritual battles that can only be won with prayer and fasting to loose the bands of wickedness preacher i can't overcome this addiction i can't over uh, uh come over this i was talking to uh, uh was it nick we were talking and uh, there was a preacher that did a sermon here's how you stop your addiction you just stop it thank you i wish i thought of that everyone that's ever checked themselves into an addiction program wanted to just stop it Sometimes there's a little bit more than that. Because it's grabbed a hold of you, it's gripped you. To the point that, you know, some even call it a disease. But I want to I wanna warn you, don't, I want to caution you, don't call it a disease. Because if it's a disease, if it's an illness, the solution is therapy. If it's a sin, the solution is repentance. We can get on track with the right solution. But it starts with calling it what God calls it. So he says this, to loose the bands of wickedness. The idea is I'm bound to this thing. To undo heavy burdens. To, to let the oppressed go free that you break every yoke. What's this talking about? Folks, there have been times where I have fasted for individuals in the church unbeknownst to them. Because I see them taken with bands of wickedness. I see them held captive. And let me just say, as a shepherd, as one who, who, who sees this calling and uh, takes it so, so seriously that I am here uh, as, as God's under-shepherd caring for this flock, sometimes the shepherd sacrifices and the sheep don't even realize what he had done for them. When David went to rescue the sheep and took them from the mouth of the bear and the mouth of the lion, that sheep had no idea how close to death David came just to save that stupid sheep. And yeah, it's usually because it's a very stupid sheep. Because they love to wander. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So you can fast on someone else's behalf. Break those chains. I knew a pastor. In fact, I met the guy at that, pastor, at that fasting conference. We called the guy on the phone. He was in Florida. He was fasting 40 days for his mother-in-law's salvation. Now, I love my mother-in-law, but I don't know that I would do a 40-day fast for her. <laughs> he fasted 40 days for his mother-in-law's salvation. Paul said this of Israel. Oh, if I could be accursed so that Israel could be saved. Moses prayed a similar prayer of Israel, and he, uh, of, of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. He said, God, write me out of your book so that they can be saved. What is it for us to just miss a few meals that someone might be saved? What is it for us to miss a few meals that some of these teenagers can break some of the strongholds that they've stepped into? What is it to, uh, for us to just to, 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 to go and, and take serious this intercessory ministry where we will pray and fast and afflict our own souls for someone else? You talk about being a servant of the Lord. 
A new commandment give I to you, Jesus said, that you love one another as I have loved you. For greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. You talk about sacrifice. You talk about laying aside some of these things. Oh, but you know, I just love my tacos. Yeah. That's a part of that flesh. The Bible talks about these ministers of the devil whose God is their own belly. That's a really interesting way of putting it. They're controlled by the flesh. Their God is their own belly. Folks, why is it we don't talk about this? Why is it preachers don't talk about this? I'll tell you why. Their God's their belly. That's a pretty bold statement. <clears throat> you know what we don't preach against? We don't preach against obesity. We don't touch on that one. And then we get up and we say, God's going to give you everything you need to overcome your sin and, and, uh, and to, to have victory. Uh, meanwhile, everyone's looking at you and saying, you're not getting much victory there, Tubby. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying we steer clear of this stuff because we tell on ourselves. But to say, God, I'm going to afflict my soul. This flesh is out of control. I need you to do something. So what will God do? He's going to start breaking some of those chains. He's going to loose some of those things. Break every yoke. Verse number 7. It is not to deal thy bread to the hungry. So in other words, you're going to not eat, but you're going to give your bread to someone else who needs it. That thou bring the poor that are cast into thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him. That thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Now, one thing, when you look at in Bible times, there's a lot that, that's, that's brought up about the poor, the naked, the needy. In those days, let me, let me just say this. If, if you're going to be truly hungry in America, you almost have to try. It's hard to find someone to really sacrifice for. That's one thing I love about missions. You know, if we're given to maybe an orphanage or, or, or just different things around the world that, that, that do meet these sort of needs because there are places that they don't have the things they have here. But let me just tell you, that guy that's panhandling on the street corner, he's not in that category. That's a tough one, right? Well, who's the poor that I can give to? You can find some needs. You can find some, some things to give towards if, if that's where God's leading. But let me just, uh, so he's saying this, you guys, you guys are making it all about yourself when there are others that have needs. And, 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 and listen, whether it be in the church community, in the church family, or just needs around about you, the idea is this, I'm going to sacrifice for myself and I'm going to help meet others' needs. Get the eyes off myself as I humble myself, as I afflict my soul, as I lower myself before the Lord. Why? Because I want God to do something. And one of the best ways to get eyes off yourself and to humble yourself is to serve somebody else. I'm going to give to others. Notice what it says in verse number 8. This is interesting. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. You know what's amazing? This happens to me every time. I come out of my fast. By the way, some of you know when I'm fasting just because of the way I preach. It, my preaching changes when I'm fasting. Right, Carrie? It's different. When I come out of my fast, it's really interesting. Uh, I had to check myself early on when I first started doing fasting because I found myself becoming almost judgmental. Because what happens is like it's almost like I come out of it and it's like the lights are on. And I see everything super clearly. And I have to remind myself, but that doesn't mean everybody sees everything clearly. <laughs> And, and, and the lights are on. God, God shines his light on certain things. And he says, well, notice this and see this. And, and uh, as I come into this thing with, uh, with, with the, the mindset of David, when he says, search me, O Lord, and know, my, uh, uh, and, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting, uh, this idea that God begins to put his finger on things and show me things that I need to get lined up with him. And the idea is that the, the, the lights come on, so to speak. You begin to see things clearly. Notice what it says next. Nine health shall uh, spring forth speedily. You know, what's interesting is in recent days, the medical community is starting to catch on with this thing of fasting. Have you noticed that? Secular doctors are starting to talk about, you know, you should fast about that. You should fast for this cancer. And what are they finding? They're finding when you fast, sometimes your fasting eats the cancer. Uh, it balances the chemicals in your body. Did you know your body is like a refinery? And those red blood cells, part of their job is to cleanse and get rid of like the dying cells and all that kind of stuff. But the problem is we always keep our bellies full, so all the blood goes there to digest. 
and it's not doing stuff in the rest of the body. So some people picked up on this and they say, you know what, I'm going to fast one day a week or three days a month or whatever, and it allows their body to almost reset. And you know what, you know what they're finding? Wrinkles are disappearing. Isn't that weird? Certain things are taking place, and I still hasn't brought my hair back, but, <laughs> but it's interesting how certain things happen. So several years ago, I cracked my ribs, and, uh, and it was like over a year, just still unhealed. The ribs are a terrible thing to break because, because they're always flexing as you breathe. So I remember laying in bed, and to roll over, I'd have to I'd get this habit. I'd hook my foot on the edge of the bed and leverage to pull over so I don't put all the pressure on my back because I cracked my ribs. <laughs> Well, I went into a fast, not for health reasons, for seeking the Lord on something. And I remember when I came off this fast, I think that one was 10 or 12 days, all of a sudden I was telling my wife, I was like, my back stopped hurting. My back went away. No, my back pain went away. Yeah, my back went away. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, now, now I have, I've had digestion issues and different things like that, and I would think, okay, maybe fasting will help reset some of those things. And that happened, but I was so shocked that my bones were restored. It was so weird. And all of a sudden, my back's better. All I'm saying is that the, the health benefits are incredible. Now, that's not the reason I went into it, but it's amazing how God does that, and sometimes you may fast for health. But he says this, Thine health shall spring forth speedily, Thy righteousness shall go before thee. That again goes, goes to that thing that God begins to see, help you see things clearly and, and, and God's righteousness is elevated to the sensitivity. Um, there are times when I'm fasting that I, I, I realize, you know what, we've allowed some things to slip in our house and, and uh, you know, we ought not to have this thing in our house. God begins to show me some things. He says, in the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Wow. Folks, isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we're after? God will be glorified in your own life. And that closeness with God, I remember uh, the first church I pastored, we had a man that fasted often. He's, he's in heaven now. Um, not from fasting, but <laughs> he's with the Lord. But he did a 40-day fast. He did a 21-day fast. He did several fasts. And he really got to hold this thing. I remember him saying to me, he said, I wish I could just fast all the time. He got to the point, he says, I just don't like eating anymore. He said, I'm so close to the Lord, and I just, I felt the, the communion that I have with him and the fellowship that I have with the Lord is just so real and so alive during those times. He says, I wish I could just always fast. Now, I don't know where you are in your walk with the Lord right now, but doesn't that sound awesome? Mm -hmm. To just have that closeness with God. What is that? Sometimes I don't really recognize it until after I'm done with my fast. And I see that closeness. I see God doing something. Sometimes there's a man, um, another man that really got a hold of this thing. He's a, uh, God's really using him in the Central Americas area, but he used to be a pastor in San Diego. And he, um, he got word that his wife was dying. And God said, uh, it's time to start fasting. And he began fasting. His wife died. See, you don't always get what you're trying to get out of it. And he kept fasting. He fasted 40 days. This was many years ago. He still hasn't remarried. He's fasted 40 days many times. But he just seeks God. And he said, here's one thing that happens. This whole thing of, God, of God's righteousness springing up and going before you. He said, God begins to break some of the strongholds in your life. You know, thoughts, different things that we're prone to be drawn away from. And he said, what's interesting is this, that, that when you're eating again and you're living your life, after a while, you know, those things start to rear their ugly head again. And he said, what's neat is once you've done that, you've gone through that long fast and God's broken some of those chains, he said, you just do a one or two or three day fast and it's like, it's like a reset button. Ah, uh, there I am again. Get back to there. So you might be looking at me saying, saying this is kind of weird. I've never really heard this kind of stuff. Folks, I, I just shared with you a huge handful of, of passages about fasting all throughout Scripture. A lot of what came up was fasting for repentance. 
There's fasting for mourning. Hey, uh, what would it be for us to give a day of fasting and prayer for our nation? So I heard one person say this. He said, don't tell me you're a patriot if you're not even going to take a day of fasting for your country. Ooh, <laughs> that kind of hurt. It's true. It says, that, that says verse number 9, Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. See, they broke through this barrier as they've been living in their sin and living in their pride and they're fasting, but it's ritualistically. And God says, that's not the fast that I've chosen. When you do it right, you get to this place. says, then you shall call on the Lord and I will answer. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here I am. Say, Lord, and God responds, whoa, you heard me that time. See, my prayers until then were just kind of going up to the ceiling and falling back down and thinking, am I even getting anywhere? It's like that Pharisee when it said he prayed within himself and that's as far as his prayer went. But now God's saying, I'm listening, I'm responding, here am I. If thou take away from the midst of the the yoke, and put forth uh, of thy finger and speak vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light arise in obscurity and thy darkness be as noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose water fail not. And they shall be of thee, uh, excuse me, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste place, places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. I like this one because now we're having a generational impact. Folks, do you realize the things we sow today are not just going to impact us? Nobody sins alone. Our sins impact others. You might say, well, my children don't know about my sins. Nope, they don't but you'll be surprised one day to find out they have the same struggle, the same addiction, the same troubles. Why? Because you won't break it. You won't take it seriously. So if you're not going to do it for your walk, consider your children. Consider the generational impact. Listen, how awesome this this idea. He said you're going to be titled, you're going to be labeled as a repairer of the breaches. In those Bible days, they would talk about the breaches in the walls, and, and, uh, and it was always a reproach to the other nations because you could not defend yourself, you could not protect yourself. In Job, we learn that God can raise up a hedge of protection around us. Sometimes we pray that. We get that from Job. And we might pray, Lord, build up a hedge around my family, around my children, guard them and guide them and, uh, and keep the enemy far from them. You want to know a sure way of doing that? Let's get back to this thing of prayer and fasting. Let's break those yokes and let's build up the hedges and let's be a repairer of the breaches because here's what begins to happen. A breach is made and the devil now has an inroad in our church, in our lives, in different areas. Why? Because we let our guard down just a little bit. And now there's a yoke, now there's a bondage that needs to be broken because we allowed an inroad for the devil. Just a little crack it starts with. He says, just open the door just a little bit. Next thing you know, there's a full-on breach. And, and what's amazing about these breaches, you have the main gate, and you've got your gate guards in the, in the city, but there's a little breach in the wall. Nobody knows about it, and everyone kind of come to and fro in there. And the enemy sneaks in. I'll say, many churches were taken down because an enemy snuck in. Jude said it this way, certain men have crept in unawares ungodly men who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. And they turned the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness and destroying churches. Folks, I want revival. I want to see God do something so bad. Are we willing to pay the price for revival? Are we willing to pray the price of revival? Are we willing to fast for revival? Revival takes place in our homes, in our personal lives, and in our church. But you know what happens when revived people assemble together in a church? The church is revived. But the, here's the crazy thing about this. I can plead with you, and I can lead you, and I can, I can, I can pray, and I can fast, and I can do all these things. 
But if we each don't grab a hold of this thing, we're going to miss it. See, it takes Henry fasting and praying, and Allie fasting and praying, and Bethany. And, and we go on down the line. And it takes each of these people saying, God, bring revival. God, bring revival. God, revive me. And God, uh, now that you put your finger on these sins and I'm repenting of this, and Lord, cl- cleanse me and purify me and revive me. And we're going down the line. We come together. Let me just say, we have then paved the way for the moving of the hand of God in our church. Right. So God, we're ready. We're ready to receive. And he says, then when you call upon me, I'll say, here am I. And we say, Lord, what would you have us to do? And God says, I'm so glad you asked. Because I do have a plan. I do have a mission. I do have a purpose for you. And your righteousness is going to go, be, his righteousness is going to go before you and the light's going to shine like noonday. Remember when Moses came off the mountain uh, after spending time with the Lord, that intimate time with the Lord, his face was glowing and the people were afraid. When's the last time you've been around somebody who was so intimate with the Lord, spent so much time with the Lord that his face was glowing? Well, you know, I just don't know it's going to be like that again. Yeah, true. The Bible says that, that, that Moses had a face-to-face relationship with God like no other person ever did. That is true. But even the disciples, when they were out there preaching, the people perceived that he had been with Jesus. Do your coworkers perceive you've been with Jesus? Do other believers see you and perceive you've been with Jesus? Did you come this morning prayed up? Spending time with Jesus. I'm done. I kind of feel like sometimes these messages, I just don't want to quite end. So much more we can go into, but I hope it stirred your heart a little bit about this thing of sacrificing for the Lord, fasting. Humbling your soul with fasting. Folks, I do believe humility and fasting are going to be a big key of this thing of God sending revival. And as we looked at it, it doesn't take many, just a few. We'll, we'll, we'll go back to R.A. Torrey's uh, quote that I mentioned a few weeks ago, and we'll look a little bit deeper into that. But he said, I've seen this formula over and over again. And if just a few people separate themselves, get thoroughly right with God, spend that time in humility and prayer and seeking his face, it doesn't need to be many, God will send revival. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet this morning.